This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Steampunk Confederation by Roger Lay, Part 2 of 3, Chapter 5, The Stone of Destiny. Telford and Eileen arrived at her flat in Mary Hill. They took off their coats and retired to the lounge. Eileen lit the gas fire. It doesn't get much better than this, Telford. A takeaway and a bottle of fizz. God, I do love haggis pakora. They ate their meal and then snuggled on the sofa. It's been a while since we've, uh, been together, Eileen. What with me being on my mission down south. I could sleep on the sofa if you'd like. Don't be silly, Telford. A woman has needs too. She led him to the bedroom. They kissed frantically, helped remove each other's clothes, and climbed into bed. Say it, Telford. Say it for me, whispered Eileen as they lay in each other's arms. Oh, thou wee and timorous beastie. No, Telford, no. I want Tam O'Shatner. Oh, all right. Um, let me see. When the peddler people leave the street and thirsty neighbors, neighbors meet, as market days are wearing late. Yes, Delford, yes, said Eileen. I love hearing your recite burns in that whiny English accent of yours. The legacy of a private education, I'm afraid, old thing. The Royal Hospital Naval Academy has a lot to answer for, particularly my form teacher, Mr. Sedgwick, the thrashings he gave me if I ever lapsed into Scottish vernacular. I was eleven years old, only a young shaver. He sighed. Eileen shook his shoulder. They continued making love until he'd finished the poem. Eileen gasped and lay back. Would you like me to recite something else? No, Telford. That was wonderful. What we need now is some inspirational music. Put Flowers of Scotland on the gramophone, and we'll see what we can do for you. Oh, not to worry. I'm quite tired, and rather full of chicken korma, if the truth be told. Would you like me to rub your back? Dressed in their leathers again, Harry and Shaky Tom stood in a cobbled street at a side entrance to the Govan Shipbuilder's drawing office. Tom was concentrating on picking the lock. His hands didn't shake as long as he was talking, so he kept up a monologue as he worked. Harry stood at his side, illuminating the lock with the smoky flame of a carbide lantern and watching the street, but managing to look nonchalant as he did so. He had a long cardboard tube under one arm. And another thing, Harry, kilts was invented by an Englishman called Thomas Rawlingson in the 18th century. Not a lot of Scottish people know that, said Tom. Nor would want to. How do you know that? asked Harry. I'm in a pub quiz team at the Bear and Penguin. I know lots of things. There was a click, and Tom pushed the door open. His hands began to shake again. Harry followed him in, shut the door, and walked ahead, reading the floor plan the young draughtsman had drawn for him by the hissing yellow light of his lamp. They moved up a flight of stairs and along a corridor to the drawing office. The door was locked. Tom stepped forward, holding his trembling lockpick. In all this foreign food, I mean, the trouble is, you don't have to cut it up, Harry. Curry and rice, chow mein, macaroni, you just shovel it in, and before you know it, the meal's over. Give me a meat and two veg with a knife and fork every time. He pushed the door open, and Harry led the way to Eileen's small side office. Tom managed to get his pick into place, and then read the sign on the door. He began to work. Honestly, Harry, how can a woman be a mechanical engineer? I mean, it stands to reason it's a bloke's game, innit? it? There was another click. The door opened and they walked into Eileen's office. It says here there's a large cabinet with a combination lock on it, said Harry, looking at the plan again. Ah, there it is. Tom pulled a stethoscope out of his pocket, inserted the earpiece and held the chest piece to the cabinet. Grimacing, he began to slowly rotate the dial on the drawing cabinet back and forth. 
Have you ever wondered about the name of the pub, the Bear and Penguin? Well, polar bears live at the South Pole, and penguins live at the North Pole. So they're poles apart, then, chuckled Harry. Tom ignored the interruption and continued. So polar bears should never be in the company of penguins, not in the natural course of events. He continued to work on the lock. So the pub's name is an attempt at surrealistic humor, then? asked Harry. Either that, or unadulterated ignorance. Got you, you little bastard. There you are, Harry. He stepped back. I don't suppose you could roll me another ciggy? Harry pulled out the top drawer and saw the ironclad plans in plain view. Bingo! First time's lucky. Let's hope she hasn't looked at them too closely. She's hardly likely to notice the difference in one small entry. He lifted them out, substituted the fakes, rolled up the originals, and dropped them into the empty cardboard tube. Right, that's it, Tom. Goodbye, Caledonia, and back to civilization. They retraced their steps, locking up as they went. That's a shame, Harry. I was getting used to the accent. I can nearly understand people now, said Tom. The Norton was in the side street where they'd left it. Harry kicked it into life, and minutes later, they were roaring through Renfrew on their way to the old M74 and the long run down to London. Next morning, Eileen and Telford sat at breakfast. Telford had three boiled eggs in front of him, all of which he'd decapitated and examined. I've always been a bit funny about boiled eggs. I like a soft yolk, but I can't stand the white being runny. Makes me go all shivery. Eileen had cooked the three eggs for two minutes, two and a half minutes, and three minutes, respectively. Telford had chosen to eat the one to his right. It all depends on the size, Telford. It's quite simple. The bigger they are, the longer they take. I'm sure you're right, and it's very nice of you to go to this trouble for me. We ought to get back to the shipyard as soon as possible. You never know. Harry might have another go at switching the plans if he realizes we've still got the originals. Don't worry, Telford. They're all safely locked away. I'm not going to let those Sassanac bastards pull the wool over my eyes. You know, Eileen, I realize we're on opposite sides to them, but I've never really understood why you hate the English so much. They stole the Stone of Scone, the Stone of Destiny, the most ancient symbol of the Scottish monarchy and independence, said Eileen. But that was in 1296. Nearly a thousand years ago, said Telford. And they gave it back in the end. Aye, they gave it back, but it was broken, said Eileen, her voice rising. Still, it's a long time to hold a grudge, darling. Chapter 6 Turnabout's Fair Play Telford and Eileen pedaled through the dank, deserted streets of Glasgow, north towards the shipyard, Having spent time in London, Telford barely noticed the smell of smoke, sewage, horse dung, and garbage. They parked and locked the tandem at the entrance to the offices. The design area was empty as they walked through and unlocked Eileen's office. Telford lit and pumped the brass paraffin stove to boil the kettle. Eileen opened her cabinet, lifted out the top drawing, and began scrutinizing it. After a few minutes, she paused. It looks as if you are right, Telford. Somebody switched these drawings. The armor plating is specified at nearly three quarters of an inch thicker than it was yesterday. It would make the ship top heavy. It would turn turtle. Just what they'd like to see happen. It's lucky you had such a good look at them yesterday. He placed a cup of tea and a plate of biscuits on her desk. Ginger nuts, the best for dunking. Eileen nodded and got busy with her correcting fluid and draughting pen. Right, she said after a few minutes. These can go to the repro department, and then I'll distribute them. Telford looked over her shoulder. Oh, I really don't like the look of these ironclad things. They remind me of overturned wheelbarrows, he said. If you talk to anybody in the government, just keep your opinions to yourself, said Eileen. Nobody wants to be told they have an ugly baby, Telford. Harry and Tom had ridden south all night with only a few short breaks. They parked the Norton outside the Baron Penguin, 
Harry knew Tom had a rented room somewhere, but he seemed to spend his life at the pub. Rosie, the landlady, was sweeping the steps as they arrived. Hello, Tom. Harry, if you want a drink, you've come to the right place. She laughed, her forty-a-day laugh, then lapsed into a fit of coughing. Harry patted her on the back. Not for me, Rosie. I could do with the coffee, though. They went inside, and Harry was struck by the sad atmosphere of an empty pub in the morning. The coal fire had just been lit and wasn't throwing out any heat. The air smelled of yeast, sweat, and stale tobacco smoke. The low plaster ceiling was cracked, yellowed, and water-stained. In the artist's corner, the ceiling had been covered in pencil drawings of all sorts. Animals, pinups, politicians. Copper pennies had been pushed into the cracks of the beams for good luck. Point of Guinness for me, said Tom as he sat down at his usual table. He handed Harry his tobacco tin. You might roll me a few spares, Harry. I'm fed up with rolling your cigarettes. What are you going to do when I'm not here? Tom sighed and picked up the tin. These Scotsmen who sound like Englishmen. I mean, it, it shouldn't be allowed. They look the same as us when they're wearing trousers. They could be spying on us. They should have to wear a badge or something. He just had time to roll a cigarette during his tirade. He fell silent, lit up despite his renewed shakes, and stared moodily into the distance. Tom's small rant reminded Harry of his old friend, Telford, the English-sounding Scotsman. He knew he'd escaped from his doomed airship because the ironclad plans had been delivered to Glasgow. Harry hoped he didn't hold a grudge. After all, all's fair in love and war, he thought. Okay, Tom, got to go. See you soon, I hope. Bye, Rosie. He walked towards the door. Tom waved languidly and took a sip of his frothy stout. See ya, Harry. Look after yourself. Once again, Harry had been ushered into Miss Rigby's office. There were no longer any seats except the one she was occupying, so Harry had no choice but to stand. He laid the roll of drawings on her desk. She kept him waiting for several minutes as she leafed through them. Looking up, she removed her monocle. We won't be renewing your contract, Lampeter. Your relationship with the SIS is over. You're going to have to get a job and work for a living, like the rest of us. Her voice was flat, her face expressionless. I've never done a day's work in my life, Miss R., as you well know, said Harry. I expect you'll team up with that half-wit friend of yours, Thomas Fletcher. What was it he did before he started dealing in drugs? She asked. He was a brain surgeon, I believe. You know, Miss Rigby, that red lipstick you wear does something for me. I can't stop thinking about it. It haunts my fantasies. I imagine you slowly licking your lips. Harry was moving towards the door. Get out, Lampeter! Get out now, or I'll... She wrenched open the top drawer of her desk and lifted out a black revolver, pointed it at the ceiling, and fired a deafening shot. Get out! she screamed. Before Harry could reach the door, it was thrown open as the guards burst into the room. I can see we're going to have to work very hard at this relationship, Miss R, said Harry seriously as he left. As he walked down the corridor, he could hear the guard trying to persuade her to put the gun down. Temper, temper, chuckled Harry as he sauntered away. He walked down the steps at the front of the building and stood in the wintry morning, wondering what to do next. He could go to his flat for a rest, or around to Emma's for some company, or back to the Baron Penguin for a drink. He took a deep breath of the frosty air. A nice big breakfast was called for. He decided to visit his club. He left the Norton in the secure car park at the observatory. A pedal rickshaw was passing and he flagged it down. Harry climbed in and sat back to enjoy the journey as they set off for the Traveler's Club in Pall Mall. He noticed that the Americans had brought in some more surveillance balloons with their underslung rotating turrets and machine guns. He caught the occasional reflection from the observer's binoculars as they swept the city, searching for targets. They passed the tower bridge, still standing along with the aerial walkway that joined the towers, but the suspension bridges that led up to them on either side were twisted wreckage, lying rusting in the stinking waters of the River Thames, and occupied by rows of seagulls. 
What remained of the shard was a smoke-blackened ruin. The Yanks have certainly had their fun, thought Harry. The rickshaw rattled over the still intact Golden Jubilee Bridge, crossed the mall, and stopped outside the Travelers Club. Harry paid the rickshaw walla and stood looking up for a moment, admiring the club's Renaissance architecture. A U.S. Air Force balloon flew over, a rare sight. Harry went inside, made his way to the coffee room, and took a corner table. He couldn't remember when he'd eaten last. Chapter 7 Brigadier Crisp Harry was enjoying a mixed grill when a stranger approached his table and coughed apologetically. Sorry to bother you, old chap, but I, uh, have a proposition for you. Would you mind awfully if I sit down? Harry waved his fork in invitation, then loaded it with a juicy piece of steak and thrust it into his mouth. He liked the knee breeches, green woolly stockings and polished brown brogues. The large, tweedy figure maneuvered its bulk into the chair opposite. The name's Crisp. Brigadier Crisp. Used to be in the same game as yourself. Still am, actually, but, uh, freelance now. Not working for Her Majesty's government anymore. Had a disagreement, parting of the ways. Irreconcilable differences, so to speak. Heard you might be available for a venture that's come my way. I know you, Brigadier. Seen your picture on the corridor at the observatory. Previous heads of SIS and all that. Yours is covered in spit. Probably to do with the Yanks attacking the building at Voxville Hall and killing most of the workforce, while you were elsewhere. Yes, yes. Water under the bridge, Lampeter. Long time ago, ancient history. Can we have a chat about the Scots? You've recently come down from Edinburgh, I believe. Despite the nonchalance manner, Harry was impressed by how up-to-date Crisp's intelligence was. He decided the Brigadier must still have contacts in SIS. Yes, Brigadier, that's right. I'm just back. How can I help? What's the caper? I'm working for the cousins now, you understand. The head of their CIA's been in touch. Chap called Wilson. Nasty piece of work. Ex-special forces. Wears a bootlace tie and one of those silver and turquoise woggle things that the Yanks like. And you can't trust a man who wears short-sleeved shirts. Anathema. Beyond the pale. Fellow was wearing a shoulder holster, too. Looked like a bloody gangster. So, putting his appalling dress sense to one side, what was his proposition? asked Harry. The brigadier leaned forward and whispered, The Americans don't approve of the North-South divide. They plan to turn the whole of the mainland of Great Britain into their 54th state. Don't want to deal with two governments, two legal systems. It would be much simpler in the terms of the bureaucracy, laws, all that sort of thing, if there was no Scottish government. Once they've taken us under their wing, they intend to move on to the island of Ireland, unify it, make it the 55th state. Harry had to swallow quickly before he burst into laughter. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong with that plan, Brigadier? Unify the prods in the mix? That'll be the day. He paused. I will await the results with interest, he said soberly, and took another mouthful of food. So, how do I fit into this grand plan? He asked. Well, you know how it is with our transatlantic cousins. Shoot first and see if there's anybody left alive to ask questions afterwards. They basically want us to subdue Edinburgh, seat of the Scottish government and all that. And how do they propose we do that? asked Harry. Well, a tactical nuke, old boy. Just a small one, you understand. Cause enough collateral damage to make the Scots see sense. I didn't think we had that technology anymore, Brigadier. Not since Dr. Riley's microbes ate all the plastic, said Harry, taking a sip of coffee. Apparently the Yanks have all sorts of stuff they keep in a bug-free bunker in the Rocky Mountains or somewhere. Once they bring the bomb out, they can only guarantee its integrity for a few weeks, what with the microbes eating all the electronics and all. So they'll ship it over on a steamer, deliver it to us, and we arrange placement? asked Harry. 
That's right, Lampeter. That's exactly right. The brigadier was red in the face and becoming excitable. I mean, I was not to reason why and all that. Job to do. Just need to get on with it. Serious money in it. Name your own price within reasonable limits. So, will you do it then, Lampeter? Brigadier Crisp sat back and mopped his sweat-filmed brow with a large white handkerchief. I most certainly will, Brigadier, said Harry as he placed his knife and fork on his now empty plate and pushed his chair back. Anything for a laugh? He began to chuckle. The Brigadier joined in. Their chuckles became belly laughs as Harry slapped the table. Several of the staff and the few early diners at the other tables looked across at them. This calls for champagne, said the brigadier, summoning the maitre d'. A toast, a toast to confederation with our American allies. One bottle of champagne and a couple of large brandies later, Harry left the club and took an omnibus north to Hackney. He arrived at Emma's flat. Her friend, Elsa Nielsen, answered the door. Hello, Harry. How are you? she asked. Harry stepped inside. I was passing and thought I'd call in for a cup of tea. Come through, Harry. Emma's in the bedroom. Harry saw that Emma was standing in front of the mirror as usual, but naked this time, except for the shoes and the hat that she'd been wearing on his previous visit. Hello, Emma, said Harry. Did you get that tattoo fixed? I did, Harry. Thanks. It was only a bit of ink leaking. No harm done. I forgive you. You look knackered, H. Are you overdoing things again? We were going to get our heads down for a few hours. Want to join us? She kicked off her shoes, placed her hat on the dressing table, and climbed into bed. Elsa slid out of her frock and laid it over a chair. We're just back from a party at the Archbishop's. We were putting on a show for him and his guests. She got into the other side of the bed. Come on, Harry, said Elsa, patting the mattress between her and Emma. You can be the meat in our sandwich. Okay, said Harry as he took off his jacket, but no biting. Maybe just a little nibble here and there, said Emma. They pulled the covers over their heads, giggling. Steampunk Confederation is one of the stories in Roger Lay's recently released speculative fiction collection, Dead People on Facebook. All the stories in the collection have been published, podcast, or broadcast in the last year, and steampunk author Jessica Lucci has included Dead People on Facebook in her January reading list for 2019. His other sci-fi book is Chronoscape, a science fiction novel about time and alternate realities. All right, well that was part two of three, so the final chapter of this story will be coming out this Friday, so be sure to come back for that. In the meantime, if you'd like, there is another story by Roger Lay on this channel. I'll make sure to leave a link down in the description to Five Years. I'm Chris Heron, and that's it for today's Tall Tale TV.